No, no, no. Don't jump. Sammy. Don't jump. Let me try. You want to try? Yeah. Please, he'll hurt me, Peter. No, I'm You're not, not going to get me for the movie. I'll come over. I'll come over. All right. <laughs> We were preparing the picture, and I suddenly stopped and thought, we're 1935, which is the middle of the Depression. The Depression is always associated to me with black and white. And we had two actors who were both blonde and blue-eyed. Little kids, smart on, were pretty, and I thought, this is not going to work. So I thought, I'm going to shoot this in black and white. I just think it's, we're going to get the period a lot quicker. It'll work better. Orson Welles always referred to black and white as the actor's friend. Why, Orson? Because every performance looks better in black and white. There you are, Peter. You got the No! <laughs> Ow! <laughs> oh, I hate that thing. This film, we wanted to shoot and treat it like an old classic 30s, 40s Hollywood black and white film. At that time, Peter was uh, working with Orson Welles. Uh, and he was very close, uh, friendly relationship, worked on a book with him. And whenever he came into town, he stayed in his house. And one day Peter said, Orson is staying with me, and I would like you to meet him, you know. And I told him, our next project is going to be black and white, and he'd like to have a little chat with you. So one evening I come over and meet this great man, and uh, I'm telling him I was testing all these black and white filters in every conditions, and he was listening to me. And when I was finishing a report, what I was doing, and he looked at me, use red filter, my boy. I said, is that right? Only red filter? He says, yes, only red filter. The red filter, it accentuates the red, which a face has a lot of red tones and red colors and makes that very white, very chalky. Also, if you have the blue sky behind it, it holds back the blue and it makes it almost black. So it creates a big visual contrast. Mr. Robertson? That's right. I'd like a minute of your time. We decided let's not have anything out of focus. And uh, Laszlo did a great job. and Pretty much nothing out of focus in this picture. That was part of the decision on the picture, to give it a kind of gritty look, a realistic look feeling of the being there and uh, the compositions were all you know with that in mind everything was going to be sharp for example i think you could see this in the train station scene where ryan is buying a ticket and you see behind the uh, ticket taker you see some little girls and they're happy and playing and everything and that's in the same shot and because there's so much depth of field they're in focus so it has the full effect of what's happening rather than cutting to those little girls being happy. You see them in the frame, and when you cut around, you see Tatum in the background, and she's also in focus, but she's sad. So you get the effect of the two things with only two shots rather than four, and it's telling the story. It's cutting in the camera, really. Of course, if you add filters to it, it's even more difficult, because you have to add more light. So it was hot, some of those sets, to work in. I used these really hot arc lights, you know, burning up. I remember uh, Ryan looked at me and says, you know, this is the, still the beginning of the picture. He says, you don't want me to have any hair left, you know, at the end of the movie? And I said, I'm sorry, Ryan, you know. And I explained it to him. He says, okay, okay, you are an artist, you know, so okay, do whatever you have to do. Uh, don't let it bother you. It ain't funny. Another aspect of Peter's style that he was using in this movie was to have long takes, to have lots of shots in one without any cutting. So that meant that we were doing five, six minute takes where the actors had to remember their dialogue. When T. Roosevelt said, we're all feeling lot better. He did, did he? Made me feel real good when he said that. Then he, 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 he Cut him. Cut him candy. And the camera crew had to accommodate lots of different moves uh, on the dolly. There were no steady cams really in those days that worked very well. I like to have scenes play in one shot, if it's possible. There's quite a few in Paper Moon. Uh, the audience doesn't notice it. They, nobody in the audience says, oh, this isn't, there's no cutting. They, people don't notice things like that. But it kind of draws you in uh, without you knowing quite why. Uh, it's like taking a breath and holding it. Most 
Let's give him some money. No. The thing that I think was the most extraordinary was this long scene in the car when they're driving. It was about a four or five page scene, the end of the first act. We shot that scene, I think, 36 times. Now, I had decided that we were going to have no cut in this scene. I felt the camera should just watch them. So I knew it was not going to be easy because while all Ryan had to do was drive the car, and he wasn't really even driving as we were pulling it. He had to pretend he was driving, but that was all. But she had so much what we call business. And then if one of them blew the line, we couldn't just say, okay, let's back up, because we couldn't back up. We would have to go the whole mile and a half and then go beyond it where there was a road where we could turn around. Well, we started and, you know, she'd blow the line. She'd blow a line like in the first few seconds. And it was, that was it. Okay, go ahead. And, then we all, and she was singing and having a wonderful time <laughs> as we went. We did it 25 times the first day. Never got through it once. Not even halfway. Well, we didn't go back for two days because we had rain. We went inside and did a couple other things. Finally, about two, three days later, we went and started again. And I think we did about 15 takes before we got it. Why didn't you tell me we're out of Bible? You're not getting the box too, don't you? Carl, you know you've got an excuse for everything. Could you blame me for it? If we were running That, in my opinion, is probably one of the reasons she got the Oscar was because they could see there was no manipulation, there was no tricks, there was no cutting, there was nothing, there was nothing you could do. That was it. And she did it. And when I see it, it still touches me how hard she worked and how good she was. Howdy. Howdy. Get the phone. <laughs> Quite often, these long takes would lead to uh, great laughter. Keep rolling. I got it. Keep rolling. I got it, I got it. We're still going. But Ryan usually suffered the most. I remember a scene in the downtown hotel where he had to eat about a thousand waffles because Tatum kept walking up and forgetting her line. It wasn't really a very long scene, but she would walk up and he'd eat another waffle and she'd forget her line and laugh and go off and we'd start again and he'd no eat another waffle. And I do think he ate about 50 waffles. Howdy. Howdy. What you having? Waffles. I already ate. I had them, too. <laughs> there were many times in the picture when, when we rehearsed a scene where I would walk the scene for Ryan or Tatum, usually for Ryan, to show him what I had in mind. <sighs> Look there. Aren't you going to go to sleep? Jack no. Because I started as an actor, I wouldn't know exactly how to tell him what to do. I'd have to sort of walk it myself and try it and play the scene as a way of figuring out what to do. You're, you're too young to smoke. You've set the whole place on fire. Now don't you drop nothing, I'm Jean. You take care of those breakables, I understand? We always got a big laugh, that entrance. The first shot it was very important that her breasts jiggle. Because we wanted the audience to immediately say, okay, we get it. You know, he's attracted to her for, you know, at least two good reasons. All of the clothes of Madeline Kahn were designed by me and built at Paramount. That when she's introduced, it's almost my best costume I've ever designed. I wanted her not to wear a bra. And she was just horrified, you know, that I would suggest such a thing. We had to actually cut out the bra itself. We gave her the support of the bra, but we cut out most of the fabric in the front of the bra so that she would definitely have jiggling breasts. Oh, I just love it, love it, love it, all this white. <laughs> I wanted Ryan to wear a sea sucker suit, which is a kind of fabric that is basically striped white and gray, and it has these little wrinkles in it. It's not smooth. And I went through all of Paramount's clothing. They had, you know, old clothes that had been used in other movies, and I pulled this Sea Sucker suit because there were doubles and triples on it. But um, it was only after pulling them that I saw the tape inside that they had been George Raft's clothes in a movie, but didn't say the movie, unfortunately. And how come that man called me a boy? I don't know. Maybe it's 
Maybe it's because of what you got on or something. The Huck Finn outfits were pulled from Paramount. I actually designed and made all of Tatum's dresses. The reason her character goes through a change is because, because of her, because she's so clever, they start earning more money. So I wanted it to show in her clothes. Well, I ain't getting back in that car, not till she gets out of it. With the sequence on the hill, Madeline Kahn, all that stuff that she did there, she's brilliant. You like Mickey the Mouse? Oh, son of a bitch! Virtually everything was one or two takes. And she has a line in the culmination of the speech. The final line is, so what do you say, Addy? Huh? Just for a little while, let old Trixie sit up front with her big tits. And uh, when in rehearsal, Madeline says, I'm not going to say that. I'm not going to say that. I'm going to say breasts. I said, OK. And just before we were going to shoot it, I went over to her just before, and I whispered in her ear. Nobody heard me. I said, say tits once, come on. And uh, I walked away. I didn't know whether she'd do it or not. She got to that moment, and she said it. Let old Trixie sit up front with her big tits. <laughs> and then her great moment is the way she looks embarrassed, having said it. And that was Madeline feeling it, because she'd never said it before. You want to get away from Miss Trixie, don't you? The second act was, uh, was a kind of complicated romantic sequence, basically. I mean, it was a comedy romance, and it became a triangle. You know, the father, the little girl, and the, the other woman. And um, Addie has to break it up. And she does what a woman will do sometimes, uh, any means to get her man back. And uh, she did. Don't knock, use a key! And she felt guilty about it, which we showed. All right, let's cut this ring around the rosy. Where's that money? One day, Alvin Sargent and Peter Bogdanovich came to me and they said, there's a scene in the movie where the sheriff is looking for the money and it's hiding in plain sight. How can we have the money hiding in plain sight where the sheriff can't see it? What, what do we do? They came to me with the problem and Paramount had the most beautiful old laces and velvets and silks and buttons. And I remember this extraordinary brown lace. And the lace was quite intricate. And I realized that if I designed a hat for Tatum, which in my mind was the hat of her mother, I thought we could have the lace go around the hat and then we could tuck the money right into the lace where unless you were really looking for it, nobody would really know it was there. So the hat itself was designed as they were doing improvements on the script. So that's how that came to be, and they were very happy with my solution. There was a few stunts in the picture, some very good driving there. And Ryan insisted on doing all his own driving, and some of it was a little dangerous. One place, Tatum's up on the boxes, and he does a corn curve, and if those boxes hadn't been attached, which they were, she would have fallen off. And she screams, and that was all ad lib. We didn't know it was going to do that. What's the matter? Damn bridge is the other way. What? Hang on. There's one action scene which we did in one shot with a camera panning around doing a 300. That was a 360 degree pan. When something like this comes up and the director says something, everybody gets very excited. I'm get very excited because there's a challenge. Now, how are we going to do this? You know. When I said, OK, let's find a focal point of the circle where the car is going to turn around. And I remember we were, there were about three of us around the camera. We all had to walk around in a circle so they couldn't see us. Where are you going to go? Don't worry about me. I got plans, new ideas coming in every day. Get going. We were ready to leave Kansas. And we still hadn't figured out the ending. Polly and I were in Kansas on our cross-country trip. And we were looking for a particular farm or something. And suddenly we realized we were on these back roads and dirt roads, and we were totally lost, and they weren't on the map. We saw this little rise, and we drove up this hill, and we got to the top of the hill, and I was trying to find out where we were. And Polly turned around and said, oh, this is nice. This kind of looks like the road to nowhere. Take a picture of this. The road itself was white chalk, and the sides were grass. And the road simply went on forever. It was just the longest white road I had ever seen. And they showed it to me. I'll never forget, Polly showed it to me. She says, I don't know what this is for, but it's a good road. The brake! The brake! It work! Now, we had established that, that the brakes were faulty on the truck. That was one thing. It was in the back of my mind. And 
we also set up this whole elaborate thing in the first act, which we didn't really deal with at all in the second or third act, which is, you owe me $200. I want my $200! Hold on. That was what triggered it, you know, because I had learned you have to pay off a joke. Pay off a joke means put a finish to it. And this was a kind of running gag. Somehow I thought, that's it, we got to pay that off. And now we also had another thing to pay off, which was the photograph in the paper moon, which we'd never done anything with. And it all kind of came together at once. What if he drops her off at the end, she misses him so much, she runs after him, he stops on the road to have a cigarette. While he's sitting there, he notices that she's left him a photograph. She runs up the road. He's kind of annoyed that she's there, even though he's secretly happy and says, I told you I don't want you riding with me anymore. And she says, you still owe me $200. Those luck! And the brakes are faulty, and so we shoot it on that goddamn hill, which we didn't know what to do with, and the uh, truck goes down the hill, and they run after it, and that's the end of the picture. But we had to shoot it before we left Kansas, because the road was in Kansas, and we were going to St. Joe's. So it was the last-minute decision, and we went out there and shot it. So it all came from a, a comedy maxim, which is pay off the joke. It was a road picture. They were on the moon. So I thought, why not? We'll end each act with the car driving away. First one ends with dust. Second one ends with rain. And the last one is the long road off into eternity.